So thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Understanding the Role of Pasta in a Healthy Diet. My name is Kelly Toops, and I am the Director of Nutrition at Old Ways, and I'm a registered dietitian. So before we dive in, I just have a few housekeeping notes I wanna go over. So yes, this session is being recorded. Um, you'll all receive an email um, within one week, usually within a couple of days, that has the CPEU certificate, the slides, and a link to the video recording. And you can also visit our website, oldwayspt.org, and in the top right-hand corner, um, you'll see something that says CPEU Library, and that's where you can register for upcoming webinars, or you can view recordings of previous webinars. Um, we do plan to have time at the end of this webinar to answer some of your questions. So please um, use the chat box um, in Zoom to submit questions throughout the webinar. Um, submit them, I guess, to all panelists um, so we can both read them and then we'll get through as many as time allows at the end. And I would also like to point out that we have another webinar coming up later this month um, about pollinators. Um, so you, you can definitely visit our website to register for that. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Old Ways, we're a nonprofit nutrition education organization whose mission is to inspire people to embrace the healthy and sustainable joys of the old ways of cooking and eating. So heritage-based diets, high in taste, nourishment, sustainability, and joy. Since 1990, we've helped people live healthier, happier lives by offering educational programs um, and resources and recipes based on shared cultural food traditions from around the world. And it's a mission we take great joy in and one with proven nutritional and emotional benefits. So I'd like to say thank you um, to the National Pasta Association for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, we're really excited to dive into the science behind one of the most popular Mediterranean foods today. Um, to give you a little background on how we at Old Ways, um, you know, got started working with pasta. As many of you can see, grain foods like pasta are at the base of the Mediterranean diet pyramid and they, place, uh, they play an important role in nourishing Mediterranean families historically. So over the past several years, um, I'm sure you've gotten questions from your patients and clients about low carb diets and things like that. And so in response, we at Old Ways have been involved with a number of projects to help consumers understand healthy carbohydrate foods and their role in traditional diets. So in addition to our work creating and running the Old Ways Whole Grains Council, um, we at Old Ways also helped organize the World Pasta Day conferences for many years where we brought together scientists from a dozen different countries to develop a scientific consensus statement on healthy pasta meals, which you can find on our website. As dietitians, I know a lot of us think very carefully in terms of like the ingredients that are in different foods, such as if something is made with whole grain flour or enriched flour. Uh, but one of the really interesting things about pasta that Diane is going to touch on today is how pasta's impact on our bodies isn't just related to the type of flour, but can actually be influenced by the way that the pasta is processed as well as the foods that it's consumed with and their synergistic effect on glycemic response. So now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Diane Welland is a registered dietitian and director of nutrition communications for the National Pasta Association based in Washington, DC. Before joining NPA, she was a freelance food and nutrition writer, speaker, consultant, an award-winning recipe developer. She wrote for a variety of consumer and trade publications, websites and blogs, specializing in stories on food and food trends, nutrition, health, and fitness, 
and is the author of several diet and health books in the Complete Idiot's Guide series. She holds a master's of science degree from NYU and dual bachelor degrees in communication and human nutrition from Rutgers. She is an active member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Food and Culinary DPG, and she's a former chair of the Nutrition and Food Sciences section of the International Association of Culinary Professionals. So now I'll stop sharing my screen and let Diane uh, turn it over to her. Thank you. And I am going to share my screen. Oh, I think it's this one here. Let's see. And you can tell me if everything is okay. Looks you, good. Looks good? Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kelly, for that introduction. I'm really excited to talk to you today about understanding the role of pasta in a healthy diet. And um, I wanted to just gonna give you a quick overview of what I'll be discussing. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the health, the history of pasta and its importance in the diet. Then I'm gonna talk about pasta nutrition and the impact of pasta on our health and health outcomes. And then I'm gonna then I'm gonna wrap up with just some ideas on how to make healthy pasta, po healthy pasta meals with healthy pasta partners and different ways of preparing pasta uh, and, and give you some ideas that you can share with your clients. So let me just get started. Whoops. Okay. Great. So pasta is an ancient fruit food. It has a very long history and its history is about as varied as its shapes. So it, while it does have widespread consumption, uh, it, we think that it has, has existed. It, the first time it was documented was in the 14th century, but we believe it existed uh, well before that. And it probably came about somewhere in ancient China, but also in the Middle East and ancient Greece. And there's actually evidence um, in Italy, there's evidence that pasta dishes appeared in Italian recipe books as early as the 12, 1200s. So um, it became a beloved food, uh, a staple in many countries rather quickly. So there's a, a picture here of some children in Naples. It was particularly popular in the Naples area um, eating pasta. And it really was a very nourishing, um, nourishing food. So it was very well respected. So exactly what is pasta and how is it made? So pasta is made from durum wheat and durum wheat is a high protein wheat. And it's, although durum wheat is now grown all over the world, uh, we know that it probably originated uh, in the Middle East. It was predominantly found in the Middle East. So likely Middle East is where um, pasta consumption uh, or pasta uh, originated. But again, uh, we, do, we, do have, um, we do have sort of suggestions that it could be in Asia as well and in China. So what happens with the flour? So you take the durum wheat and you grind the wheat and it releases a starchy endosperm. And this endosperm, um, the, the endosperm that's released is in a coarse granule and it's kind of a pale yellow color. And these granules are called semolina. The semolina then is then combined with water and it's hydrated. And then it's mixed and kneaded into a very elastic shape. So, um, it's, it's mixed in into actually like a paste and then it's pressed and extruded into different shapes. So, um, and it's actually this extrusion process that is unique to pasta. And I wanted to kind of show you this picture because really pasta is not made any different from what it was made in the 18, this is the 1870s. People were, you know, just kind of mixing it by hand, kneading it, pressing it, and then extruding it. And today we use a machine that quite looks like this. It's all automated, but really basically it's the same process. It's mixed, it's kneaded, and then it's extruded. So um, 
the the point is is although you know the the the, the actual equipment has changed, <laughs> um, the process has not. So pasta is still made the same way. So and it is this extrusion process that I mentioned to you that combines the protein and the starch and gives pasta its like strong elastic structure and shape. So the protein actually forms somewhat of a shield around the starch molecule. And then um, if it's dried, then the drying actually increases its strength and allows it to have a longer shelf life. So this process actually affects how it's digested uh, because of the combination, I said, the unique structure between the protein and the carbohydrate. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Um, but dry pasta typically lasts about one to three years. And there is actually about 600 different shapes of pasta now um, worldwide. So there, you, can, you can actually produce pasta in practically any shape. So in America, uh, pasta first came to our shores with the help of Thomas Jefferson in the 1780s. Uh, Thomas Jefferson made many trips back and forth to Europe, um, and he brought the first macaroni maker. And this is actually a, a, a sort of a, a little snippet from one of his letters where he actually drew a pasta making machine, um, you know, uh, you know, for like that he sent to his people in, in, um, in Monticello. So um, macaroni, so they, they called it macaroni and it was pretty much an expensive, very expensive and it was a delicacy mostly for the upper class. And of course, pasta and pasta ingredients were imported. So very, very little was made. But that all changed, uh, however, in 1880 to, from 1880 to 1905. And that's when a wave of Italian immigrants came to our shores. They came through Ellis Island, they came in other ways, but during that short period of time, more than 5 million Italians, mainly from Sicily, but from other parts of Italy as well, immigrated to the United States. And so they brought with them their culinary culture, their traditions, and their love of pasta. Pasta became a staple in the Italian American community, but it was very much considered an ethnic food. So I just wanna mention then two more really important times for the pasta industry. So um, pasta was imported, um, all the ingredients uh, were, came from Europe, uh, even, even the pasta making itself, most of it was uh, imported. And then World War II came along. And so when World War II came along, there was a ban on all European imports. This forced uh, pasta manufacturing companies to emerge because now they couldn't, get, um, they couldn't get their beloved pasta, especially in these very big Italian ethnic communities. Uh, another thing that happened in addition to you know, the pasta industry forming and emerging at this time, particularly in the New York area and the Brooklyn area, was that um, the farms, they um, went, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so what happened is the, the farmers began growing durum wheat. So they went out West. So now we didn't have to purchase durum wheat from Europe. Now we could buy it. Now we could grow it domestically ourselves. So this was all as a result of World War I. And then the second significant event um, in that time, or I guess the third, is the um, World War II. Because while during World War I, the industry emerged, it was still primarily just the ethnic community. But after World War II, many Americans, American soldiers were exposed to pasta, either when they went to Europe and they started eating pasta or just um, during their, their tours. So, World War II exposed many Americans to pasta and it became much, became mainstream. It became a, a very much an American food rather than an ethnic food. And so that also then began the emergence of the pasta industry and it just, just grew from there. So why did pasta become so popular? Well, obviously it's convenient. It's affordable if for anyone on a budget. Uh, it's easy to prepare. It's well liked, and of course, it's nutritious. 
So pasta became beloved, pasta is loved not only by you know, Americans in the United States, but all over the world. And so I wanted to show you this pasta consumption, some of these pasta consumption figures, because as you can see, Italy still it dominates when it comes to pasta consumption. And if you look at the United States, we're pretty far down here. We're at eight pounds, almost nine pounds per capita, but that's really nothing compared to how much Italians eat. So that's three times as much, nearly three times as much um, pasta they eat in Italy as they do in the United States. And I just wanted to mention that pasta rates of obesity are one in 10, about 20% of Italians, while in the United States, uh, our rates of obesity are about 40% or two in five. Also, if you look at chronic illness, um, Italy has lower rates of chronic illness, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes than the United States. In fact, many of these countries um, all have lower rates of chronic illness um, and lower rates of obesity compared to the rates that are in the United States. So I just wanna point that out um, as sort of an observational um, look at, at pasta consumption. So really it's, it's not pasta that's, that's causing these things. So now let's talk about pasta and your health. So the first thing that I wanna do is look at pasta nutrition. So of course, pasta is uh, a source of carbohydrates. The dietary guidelines recommend about 45 to 65% of your total calories come from carbohydrates. So it's an excellent source of energy and is the main source that your body wants to use. The National Institutes of Academy of Sciences recommends consuming at least 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. That's about 520 calories, which is the minimum amount of carbohydrate needed to produce enough glucose for your brain to function. And um, of course, uh, glucose is the main fuel for your brain. So that's, that's very important. Carbohydrate um, pastas also supplies a number of vitamins and minerals. And so first let me talk about enriched white pasta and then I'll talk about whole grain pasta. So enriched white pasta, one cup cooked is about 200 calories. It contains, um, it's it's enriched with folate. So it contains about 25% or more of the daily value for folate. And it's a good or an excellent source of a number of other B vitamins. And that's mainly enriched pasta. This would be enriched pasta. So vitamins like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and then the 10% daily value for iron. There is actually a small amount of fiber in pasta. So it contains anywhere like around one to two grams. Um, and interestingly, uh, because of the amount of pasta that we consume in this country, um, and even though it's not as much as, as a country like Italy, it is quite a bit, um, the majority, you know, a large portion of our fiber is gotten from white enriched pasta, just for the fact that we consume um, such large amounts of it. Um, that it does, does impact our fiber uh, consumption. Whole grain pasta, one cup cooked is about 175 calories. So it's a little, has a little less carbohydrates. Uh, it does contain small amounts of B vitamins, uh, but not as much as the enriched pasta. It's also higher in fiber, about three times more fiber than uh, a white pasta. And it also contains many other nutrients like uh, phytonutrients and plant compounds, copper, manganese, selenium. And of course there's no cholesterol in pasta and it's naturally low in sodium. So now let's talk about the impact on health and blood sugar levels. Pasta is considered a low glycemic index food. So let me talk to you a little bit about glycemic index. Glycemic index measures how fast and how much a certain food raises our blood sugar level. Ideally, you want foods to keep your blood sugar levels more stable. You wanna avoid spikes and peaks 
and you want um, and foods that are considered to be low glycemic index are slowly absorbed, digested, and metabolized. And because they're absorbed slower, they result in a slower and lower rise in blood sugar levels and ultimately insulin levels. So ideally, you really want to choose these low glycemic index foods. And pasta varies depending on the size and shape of the pasta. The majority though fall below 50. Uh, most of them are in their 40s. Um, and, and I listed there what um, a low glycemic index food is, a medium glycemic index food and a high glycemic food. And although pasta is classified as a refined carbohydrates, not all refined carbohydrates have the same effect on blood sugar. So for example, refined carbohydrates like pies, cakes, and cookies um, are considered high glycemic index foods. Um, they are not considered a low glycemic index food. And um, the main reason why pasta is considered a low glycemic index food and does um, keep the uh, blood sugar levels more stable is related to the way it is processed and the type of wheat that is used. And that's that high protein durum wheat. So I mentioned to you the way that the process is kneaded, it's mixed, and then it's extruded. And then it has kind of a protein web and then kind of a protein shield around it. So that um, flour, when it combines with the water, it produces actually a gelatinized starch granule in that sponge-like web of protein. So um, the extrusion process creates, the protein creates kind of a shield around the starch granule. And it's this unique starch protein structure that you know, allows this carbohydrate to be digested more slowly, breaks down more slowly um, compared to other refined carbohydrates like breads and cereals um, because because of the way that it's processed. If the process is, uh, if the pasta is dried, that actually strengthens the protein shield a little bit more. So a study looking at the glycemic response of starch and pasta compared three types of pasta products. It was a macaroni and a spaghetti um, to a bread product and found that the pasta meals produce significantly lower peak blood glucose values and lower GI than the corresponding bread. And other studies have found similar uh, results. And so I wanted to share with you, this is one of the 12 points of the scientific consensus statement um, on healthy pasta meals. And I know Kelly had mentioned it earlier. This was um, developed by 20 scientists and health professionals from nine countries, and they extensively reviewed, reviewed the research. It was, um, it was hosted by the International Pasta Organization, IPO, and Old Ways. And so I just wanted to pull out one of these 12 points. At a time when obesity and diabetes have a high prevalence around the world, Pasta meals and other low glycemic index foods may help control blood sugar and weight, especially in overweight people. Glycemic index is a factor that impacts the healthfulness of carbohydrate rich foods. And there is a beneficial effect in the way pasta is made. The process of manufacturing reduces its glycemic response. So, Although the importance of glycemic index in health is controversial, the 2015 International Scientific Consensus Summit of the International Carbohydrate Quality Consortium concluded that postprandial glycemia was important in overall health and that GI is relevant to prevention and management of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, and probably obesity. I do want to mention that just recently a study came out, um, carbo, a carbohydrate insulin model that actually looked at um, GI index as, as well and um, confirmed some that, that low glycemic index foods uh, are beneficial for health. The next thing I wanted to mention is resistant starch. Pasta contains resistant starch. In fact, all starchy foods contain 
some amount of resistant starch. Resistant starch are starches that uh, pass through the small intestine undigested, but are later broken down by the gut bacteria in the large intestine. So they very much act like a fiber, if that sounds familiar to you. Um, they have um, beneficial properties, um, and I'll mention those in a moment, but let me first tell you of how um, resistant starch uh, comes about because it is affected by how the food is prepared. So you can actually increase or decrease the resistant starch. So cooking, cooling, and reheating pasta actually creates resistant starch. So what happens is the starch undergoes a retrogradation. It actually changes. The glucose mo molecules break down and then they reassociate with each other. And they do this in an irregular fashion. And this is post gelatinization. But when they reform, they reform into uh, this resistant starch and it is not digested uh, efficiently. So uh, basically it is not digested by the small intestine and that's where it goes into the gut and then it's just, um, and just, and just broken down by the, by the gut bacteria. And once this happens, it doesn't go back. So when pasta is cooked and cooled, the retrogression happens during the cooling process. If you reheat that pasta again, uh, you're still gonna have that same amount of resistant starch. It doesn't change back. So, um, and, it, and it's related to the protein portion. Once the protein portion changes, it, it doesn't um, revert back. So it is not affected when the pasta is reheated. And in fact, uh, there was more research uh, looking at these three pasta, preparation methods, hot, cooked, cooled, hot, cooked and cooled, and then cooked and cooled and reheated. And um, they also, and they had participants eat um, pasta in each of these three ways. And then they looked at baseline um, blood glucose levels. Um, and they found that uh, pasta preparation can influence postprandial glucose response. So the foods with the higher resistant starch produced a lower glycemic response and contributed to having a lower glycemic index. Um, and in fact, it was the food that was cooked, cooled and reheated that, that um, some studies actually found the, the biggest response. So um, Resistant starches then may be, there's other research which shows resistant starch may be beneficial for the microbiome. It actually acts like a prebiotic. So they're good for people who have diabetes. They can help with weight management and also help control appetite. And that brings me to uh, pasta and diabetes. So, of course, it's very important to have uh, stable blood sugar levels um, and also to have the blood glucose levels be absorbed um, slowly over time. So that's important for people with diabetes. But unfortunately, many people mistakenly believe that pasta is off limits if you have diabetes. And actually I've been talking to some dietitians and they told me that their clients come in, especially the clients that are newly diagnosed with diabetes and say that their, either their doctor or their healthcare provider told, her that they, told them that they can't eat pasta anymore. And some of them are just devastated. And that is just not true. Um, in fact, according to the American Diabetes Association, there is no evidence to suggest that people with diabetes need to avoid carbohydrates such as pasta However, portion size is key. That is important no matter what for any person with diabetes um, and managing your eating plan. But preparation can also make a difference. Cooking the pasta al dente, and al dente means to tooth. That means um, it would be slightly chewy on the chewy side, ensures that the pasta will also have a low glycemic index. Um, because if you do cook the pasta, like overcook it so that it gets mushy and soft, then um, the starches break down more easily and they get absorbed faster 
and that increases the glycemic index and increases the absorption level of pasta. So you really wanna cook it al dente. You wanna cook it on the chewy side. Again, cooking, cooling, and reheating the pasta also may make a difference. And in fact, um, this became so popular in England, there was a BBC show where a nutritionist, uh, it was a doctor show, she asked 10 participants to eat three different bowls of pasta. They, they had all the same sauce on them, tomato sauce. One was freshly cooked, one was cooked and cooled, one was cooked and cooled and reheated, and then they tested blood sugar levels. And they actually found that the cooked, cooled, and reheated pasta, again, showed the lowest rise in blood glucose. So this, this study supports the, the other one that I just mentioned. Um, and it is something to keep in mind when you're talking to your clients. Finally, uh, adding vegetables and limiting the sauce is something to consider. Keep the sauce light, include lots of vegetables. In some cases, you may even be able to double the recipe. Uh, a standard serving size is one cup of pasta, but if there are concerns, you can always decrease that and uh, have a half a cup of pasta and double up the vegetables. Again, just being aware of what you put on your pasta and what you tell your patients to do with it. Okay, so pasta and cardiovascular disease. So pasta is a key component in the Mediterranean diet and an integral part of that diet, uh, along with an abundant of, abundance of fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, legumes, whole grains, and cereals. So the principal source of fat comes from olive oil, and the diet includes moderate amounts of lean fish, uh, poultry, eggs, and dairy, and small amounts of red meat. And it also allows for red wine in moderation. So the American, Assist American Heart Association recommends following a Mediterranean style diet to help prevent heart disease and stroke and reduce risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. This is supported by a large number of studies. There are actually hundreds of studies looking at the Mediterranean diet and the benefits of following a Mediterranean diet. Um, and they include observational studies, randomized clinical trials, and in-depth meta-analysis. So there's, there's just a wealth of studies out there which support um, the Mediterranean diet reduce, uh, related to reducing cardiovascular disease and chronic illness in general. In fact, there are um, also studies which show that the Mediterranean diet reduces all cause mortality. And I just want to mention one study. It was a recent review done, done uh, by the um, um, published in the American Heart Association's journal Circulation that concluded that based on the amount of strong and consistent data, better conformity with the traditional Mediterranean diet is associated with better cardiovascular health outcomes, including clinically meaningful reductions in rates of coronary heart disease, ischemic stroke, and total cardiovascular disease. So other healthy diets that include carbohydrate-rich rich pasta is the DASH diet, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, I believe that includes whole grain pasta, but I, I think it also includes uh, white pasta as well. Uh, the healthy vegetarian diet and the vegan diet, and of course the healthy US standard diet. Now, what about low carbohydrate diets? You may have heard about them. They're pretty popular in the media, but there really is very little research out there on low carbohydrate diets and their health benefits. Um, and many of them exclude or limit pasta, but the research is really inconsistent, it's inconclusive, and there is really no specific de definition of what a low carbohydrate diet is. There's not really a consensus about that for sure. There's also concerns about the long-term effects of a low carbohydrate diet on cardiovascular disease. So much more research needs to be done um, uh, on this area. So when it comes to overall diet, uh, I wanna mention this study which looked at pasta intake linked to better diet quality. So pasta can play a major role in improving health. So this study was published in Frontiers in Nutrition in August of 2020. 
and it looked at pasta consumption and diet quality. It specific look, specifically looked at healthy eating index, the healthy eating index score. This was an NHANES analysis, and it was a modeling study, and it compared diet quality of pasta eaters compared to non-pasta eaters. And we were, um, it was specifically looking at a dry pasta. Um, and overall pasta, and it looked at both children and adults. Overall pasta consumption was associated with a better diet quality, improved nutrient intake, um, and uh, lower in improved nutrient intakes of the nutrients we need more of, but it also had lower intakes of the nutrients that we need less of and we need to limit. So I'm not gonna go through um, all of these. You can see you know, the types of nutrients that had greater intake and the ones that dropped. Uh, but I did wanna also mention that this is just some of the, the uh, media uh, that, that we saw related when this study was released. So this really shows that people are just looking for information on pasta. They really wanna know that pasta is good for you. People love pasta. It's a comfort food. Um, it grew tremendously during the pandemic. Uh, people are still eating it. They love it. They have fond memories of it and they want to believe that it's healthy. They want it to be healthy. So they're looking for this type of information. Um, they really want to, to show that pasta is, is healthy. So this is a second study. This study it was um, presented as an abstract at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo, but it has not been published yet. It, it has been submitted for publication. So uh, we're hoping that it will be published in the next few months, but you never know. But this builds on the previous research, which showed that pasta intake um, is specifically looked. It specifically looked at food groups and showed that pasta intake is higher, has higher vegetable intake, uh, particularly in adults. But these similar results are also um, for children as well. And you can also note that there was a higher intake of whole grain intake as well. Uh, and um, I'm sure you can guess of what type of vegetable that there was a higher intake for. So there's a picture of it right there. So of course it was the red orange vegetable group, um, mainly due to tomatoes uh, because most people put tomato sauce on their pasta. So that does make a difference. And if you add it all up of the amount of pasta that you eat and the amount of uh, tomato sauce, uh, that does increase your vegetable intake. So um, red, orange vegetables. So that, that includes tomatoes, but it also includes peppers and some of the other vegetables. So be on the lookout for this when it comes out. Now I wanna mention pasta and obesity and weight gain because pasta does not make you fat. Um, and this research here uh, shows that there is no difference was seen in total daily calories and sodium, sodium intake. Um, there was no significant association seen with body weight, waist circumference, and body mass index in children and adult males. Um, now, now this, and, and let me tell you that this uh, references the diet quality study I mentioned earlier. So this was an NHANES modeling study. Um, but particularly I want you to note is that um, in adult women, pasta eating was associated with reduced waist um, circumference and uh, uh, lower body weight um, and lower BMI. So um, that was particularly interesting, but that isn't the only study to show this. Now, this is a, a modeling study, but there is, uh, an, I wanted to mention another study which looked at pasta intake. It was a little bit different. It looked at pasta intake related to dietary patterns and it looked at it in the context of a low GI da uh, diet, but it was a systematic review and a meta-analysis. It looked at 32 trial comparisons and it found that pasta consumed this way on the low GI diet did not contribute to weight gain and could even have an adverse effect. That means that um, people who ate pasta actually lost weight. Uh, the weight was about a half a kilogram, so it's, all, it's not uh, a lot, but it's significant. Um, it's significant weight loss when it comes to uh, research. 
um, and also compared with diets that are high, higher in GI. So according to the dietary guidelines, up to 50% of your grain intake can be whole grain, 50% or more, and the other 50% then can be um, enriched pasta or white pasta or refined pasta. Um, and their uh, typical serving size is two ounces, which is one cup, which is about 200 calories or 175 calories if you're looking at whole grain. And I just want you to mention that pasta is considered part of a healthy diet. It is mentioned, in, and these are the four, di uh, three diets that are mentioned in the dietary guidelines. And this photo here, I pulled directly from the dietary guidelines. So although um, the dietary guidelines uh, recommend avoiding refined carbohydrates, pasta isn't in that category. And as you can see, this is a meal that uh, was included and um, in the dietary guidelines um, recommendations. And this was one of the sample meals, oven roasted tilapia and vegetables with pasta. So, um, you know, that's just to show you that pasta can easily fill, fit into these healthy dietary patterns. So now what about healthy pasta partners? I mentioned to you, um, so, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is healthy pasta preparations. So I mentioned to you al dente and the reason why al dente is the best way to prepare pasta. You don't wanna overcook your pasta and um, it will be absorbed more quickly. Um, and it could cause uh, a higher, you know, sort of spike or, or increased insulin um, as well. You also want to have cooked and cooled pasta dishes, ideally pasta salads. But there is something, um, something, another preparation that I want to mention that I haven't mentioned before, and that's the addition of vinegar or lemon juice. Again, this is something that you can easily do because you can easily make a pasta salad. But studies show that acids like lemon juice and vinegar actually inhibit the salivary alpha amylase enzyme. So that's the enzyme that starts working um, to break down starches in your mouth. And if every, any of you have ever done that experiment where you take a piece of bread, you put it in your mouth and you just let it sit there for like a minute or two minutes and you realize that it just breaks down into a kind of mush. Well, that's the um, enzymes, the amylase enzymes working to break down the starches. So with the addition of acid, again, whether it be in the form of vinegar or a lemon juice, it actually inhibits that salivary enzyme the alpha amylase enzyme. And so you have less of it and it's breaking down the starch and that reduces the amount of starch that breaks down. It reduces the amount of starch that then that's available for digestion. Um, and then it, it reduces the amount that's absorbed. So that um, at least in part is a reason why there, there could be a reduction in blood glucose response. And in one study uh, with the lemon juice, the starch release was about twice as low. A second study looking at vinegar suggests that um, actually a, it doesn't really take that much. It was just two teaspoons or a small amount of vinegar ingested with the meals. So this only works when there is a carbohydrate starch meal. So you need to have acid and the starch together and that can reduce postprandial glucose response by about 20%. And of course, what you pair with the pasta also makes a big difference. So you wanna be adventurous, high fiber foods and vegetables in particular go really well with pasta. And you should think of pasta as a blank canvas. Uh, you can pair pasta with practically anything, beans, peas, lentils, cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, uh, soy, tofu, nuts, and seeds. So any of these will work beautifully with, with pasta. Uh, pasta partners are lean, like lean proteins, uh, again, seafood, lean chicken, beef or pork, nut butters. Um, think about um, peanut butter is used often as a sauce with, with um pasta in Asian dishes, which brings me to healthy pasta partners, you know, kind of looking at it in a different way. 
And that's looking at it, as I said, um, be adventurous, think of pasta as a, you know, a blank canvas and you can use any local ingredient, um, combine it with pasta to create a more sustainable meal, to reduce food waste and that supports your community. So now it's fall. So pasta is perfect partners with some of the squashes and like things like pumpkin and um, even some of the leafy greens that are coming out, beets are gonna be coming out as well. Some of these cool weather vegetables, perfect combinations with pasta. Also globally inspired ingredients. Um, pasta, it, it goes well with practically any food. Asian, Middle Eastern, uh, typical American cuisine or traditional American cuisine, um, and of course, any kind of European cuisine. So exotic spices, herb blends, anything like that, um, ideal for, for pasta and some light pasta sauces as well. And you can use these to make like vegetable puree type sauces um, or drizzle of olive oil. Uh, again, be creative. So finally, I just wanna share some of the resources that are available um, on our site, the sharethepasta.org site. There's nutrition information, there's cooking tips, uh, a nutrition toolkit, and I will be sending uh, Kelly the link to that. I'll also be sending off all of the studies that I mentioned to you in, on a re in a reference list, uh, but I just wanted to show you some of the things that you can find on the website. Some of the things that are particularly pop popular are pasta shapes dictionary, which pastas go with what sauces, uh, types of pastas, and then we have kind of a, a pasta IQ. Also, um, we have a, a wonderful chef called Chef Rosario who does uh, videos on cooking very simple pasta meals, easily done. Some are vegetarian, some aren't, uh, seasonal ones. Um, and there are many, many recipes with some beautiful photography on our site. And you can also reach us at, um, on any of these social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Okay, um, hopefully uh, we still have time for questions. And um, here's my contact information. So let me look at some of the questions because honestly, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Yeah, thank you everyone um, for submitting a lot of great questions. Um, I saw uh, one of the first ones to come in was asking about the difference between whole grain pasta and enriched pasta. Um, so, I mean, I'm happy to speak to that from the perspective of the Old Waste Whole Grains Council. Um, you're definitely going to see some nutritional differences um, in enriched pasta. They add back a lot of the B vitamins. Um, so those uh, numbers will be higher in the enriched, um, but in the whole grain pasta, you'll see more fiber, more protein, and lots of other uh, minerals. Uh, so we definitely do encourage people uh, to seek out a whole grain option if they're looking for more of a nutritional punch on their dish. Um, but, you know, as Diane was sharing, there's People don't need to be scared of white pasta necessarily um, just because the way that it's made um, doesn't spike our blood sugar the way that a lot of other refined foods do. Um, so I saw, um, Diane, we had a, an interesting question about someone asked that they read that there is an impending shortage in Durham wheat flour and asked if you knew how this may threaten the pasta supply or if people should be aware of that? So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go out and, and buy all the pasta on the shelves <laughs> just yet. <laughs> um, but honestly, there are supply issues uh, pretty much as a result of COVID everywhere. So um, I wouldn't say there is a shortage, uh, but prices um, have, rid have risen and I'm not sure how that is going to be filtering, um, filtering down to the consumer, but um, there are supply issues with, with everything, not, not just pasta and not just food ingredients. So um, no, I do not you know, think that there's going to be a pasta shortage anytime soon. Um, not, any, not like anything, you know, any other uh, product that's what it's happening right now. So, um, no. 
We also got a lot of really interesting questions about like different types of pasta. So people were asking about like nutritionally, I think a lot of the studies you were pointing to looked at like traditional Durham wheat pasta, uh, mm -hmm. dried pasta that had been extruded. Uh, but people were asking, um, you know, if these findings also apply to things like egg noodles or gluten-free pastas. Um, so I know that egg noodles are produced similar in a similar way with the extrusion process. And I would think a lot of uh, what I was talking about probably has to do with the protein portion as well as the uh, uh, starch portion. And I think the protein sort of forms a web, which actually just catches the, you know, the, the, the carbohydrate is gelatinized, the endosperm gelatinizes and the protein sort of catches it. And that sort of slows down the digestion because it kind of blocks it um, in a way. So I would think that egg noodles would be similar. I haven't seen any research specific to egg noodles. Um, when it comes to uh, different types of pasta using different types of products, I don't know how that would break down. Uh, I. I don't, I haven't seen any research on it. It really didn't look, but I would think that um, it would be different. And, you know, if it's a potato starch versus a rice starch uh, versus a, a non-wheat starch, it certainly would have a, a different effect. Yeah, and to the person who was asking about um, the glycemic index of some of these different types of pastas, you can go to glycemicindex.com and they have a search box. So I just looked up gluten-free pasta and some of the, the rice and corn-based ones will, did have a higher glycemic index, um, you know, the, because they weren't made with that Durham wheat and, um, you know, not produced in the same way. Um, some of the bean-based pastas did have a lower glycemic index um, than the, the rice-based one. So it kind of depends on what the, you know, these days you can find a pasta made out of almost anything. So, uh, I think, you know, they really require further investigation, um, before, you know, uh, we can figure out what their impact is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you're, you're very, that's absolutely spot on with, with the legume pasta versus, you know, other types of, of it depends on the starch. It depends on the amount of protein. And how, and how it acts you know, during the processing. There were a lot of really um, interesting questions about when you were talking about that amylase activity. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asked if the acidic amylase situation works with tomato sauce and pasta, because tomato sauce is kind of acidic. So I haven't seen any research. I think that um, I haven't seen any research on tomato sauce. And I, I think just from my gut, I would think, um, and I'm only guessing here is that this, the, the way that it works, it has to be very acidic. So lemon juice and vinegar are really pure acids. There's nothing else, you know, kind of in there with it. So the tomato sauce, although it's acidic, it's not at the acidic level of a lemon juice or a vinegar. And I think it would um, probably have to be at that level in order to inhibit the amylase. So I am, um, but, you know, I don't know the answer to the tomato sauce and pasta, but I would think that it, it probably doesn't have the same effect. And then similarly, someone asked about like, could you potentially cook with some vinegar in the pasta water to lower salivary amylase activity? Or would that cause the pasta to get too soft if you added it to the cooking water? No, I don't think it's going to work if you add the um, vinegar or the lemon juice to the water while you're cooking it. Um, I think it needs to be uh, it needs to be broken down in the mouth um, because uh, it's it's the process. It it it's twofold, so it's it's actually inhibiting your your own salivary amylase. So that wouldn't happen if you put it in with the water. Um, and as, as then, because the salivary amylase doesn't just happen in your salivary gland, I think also it goes down um, and there's some in your stomach as well. So it's, it's sort of that whole digestion process. So um, I think you would actually need to have the starch acid combination meal uh, together and then actually chew it. So sorry about that. Yeah. 
you talked a lot about portion size and you know the importance of being mindful of you know what an appropriate portion of pasta is and um one of our viewers was asking like logistically how do you measure long pasta portion <laughs> um, like, so so that's a little tough actually i think they do have these little measuring things um but pasta portions are usually in two ounce uh, portions, and that's usually what gives you a cup of pasta. So there's kind of two ways you can do it. You can try to figure out, you know, perhaps like if you have a little scale, I, I always, I have a scale in my, my kitchen that I use all the time and not most, most people probably don't, but you could put two ounces on there and then do it. Or another option is you can cook the pasta and then the cooked pasta you can put in a cup and you can measure it, you know, after cooking, you know, which which also can help you sort of eyeball how much pasta that is. And that's what you want to want to really learn how to do is kind of just figure out how much what a cup looks like on the plate, you know. So, um, and again, you could even cut that in half to a half a cup um, and double your vegetable portions of something like that. It's, um, but it's a matter of getting used to seeing how much it is. And honestly, um, I, when I've measured pasta, like a cup is a really good portion size. I mean, you know, um, you know, we actually have, you know, half cup portions in a lot of our recipes and that works out fine because you're, you're not just having pasta all by itself. You're combining it with a lot of other foods. And so uh, a lot of like vegetables, you've got onions and mushrooms and peppers and whatever. So you're really building it up you know, that helps. We have um, a dietitian who's writing from the Midwest region of the United States. She was saying um, some of her patients and clients don't really like the taste of al dente pasta, or they don't like the texture of it and asked if you had tips for, you know, getting people more used to that or making it more inviting. So that's going to be one of those things where if they really don't like it, I wouldn't push them to do it, but then I would try other things. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would try the pasta salads, you know, um, I would try pairing it with, or the cooked and cooled pasta. Oh, yeah. If you cook and cool the pasta and then reheat it, even if it's not al dente, you'll still get the benefits of the resistant starch. So that could be an option. You know, that could help. And again, combining it with any kind of beans and grains and things like that. So, you know, even cooking, like cooking the pasta well, like I said, if you cook it, cool it, and then reheat it, you know, that'll also help um, stabilize the blood sugar. That will work. And someone, just to confirm, the portion size of two ounces, that's dry, right? That's not... Yes. Yeah, that's dry. And again, it depends on the shape of the pasta. So like elbow macaroni, you know, might might be a little bit more than, you know, extra thin pasta ex kind of expands a little bit, but, you know, more or less, you know, we've, we've got that two ounces into one cup kind of thing. So again, the, the best thing to do is to cook it and then put it in a cup and then eyeball it and see, we'll see what that is. And then you kind of get an idea of how much you can cook too. So that'll work. Thank you so much. I think maybe we just have time for one more question. Um, we had someone ask their clients have traveled to Italy and they say that they tolerate pasta better than in the United States. Um, you know, maybe they have gluten sensitivity, but this dietitian has not seen any studies that support this phenomenon of what you know these clients or patients are reporting do you have any information about that or so um it could be that they're preparing the pasta a little bit differently than we normally prepare it in the united states so um they do prepare it more on the al dente side and and that you know that could be it sometimes um the pasta could be slightly different in that the type of wheat that is used. Uh, again, it could be durum wheat, but durum wheat varies. It's a, it's a agricultural product, just like any other agricultural product. And so 
we have durum wheat produced in Canada, we have durum wheat produced in Italy, we have durum wheat produced in the United States. So um, that could have some effect. And you know, if, if it's homemade pasta, they could be making it slightly different than um, you know, some of the pasta that we see here in the United States. So there's kind of a lot of variables of why that could be, you know, so. Um, yeah, and I would imagine like the ingredients that they're tossing it with could be different too, like maybe not even the pasta itself, but what's in the sauces or, mm -hmm. you know, um, different European countries have different laws about, you know, what type of inputs they use during agriculture and, you know, mm -hmm. um, they yeah, could have a different sauce. So it could be a lot of things. But anyway, thank you so much for your time, Diane. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I just want to remind you one more time that yes, we will be emailing you the certificate, the CPU certificate, the slides and the recording um, within one week. So definitely within the next couple of days, check your email and we'll be sending that out. And um, with that, thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you everyone.